Hey, welcome, dear friends who have gathered. I'm going to invite you to join with me in prayer. Let's ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Uh, Heavenly Father, we've come to meet with you. And, and just as Peter, James, and John met with you on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was so good they didn't want to leave. Lord, I ask that your peace, your presence, your, your beauty would be on such display. It would be so good we would not want to leave. So bless the preaching of your word. Help us to see Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So I am confident it is a good day today. That is because I get to eat a lot of food. It's picnic day. Welcome once again. Welcome once again. And uh, you've come during our sermon series on Job. And though we're going to be real with suffering, we're also going to be real with the fact that Jesus wins, that grace wins, that he can bring peace to situations that are anything but peaceful and strength to get us through. And as we continue our series on Job, I have this simple observation, and this is this. There are some really smart, dumb people. You know what I'm saying? There are some really smart, dumb people. Now, don't park, poke the next person next to you, eyes up here. But there are smart, dumb people. I, I remember being in college, and one of the classes I hated was philosophy. Anyone ever take philosophy? Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe your experience was like mine, where they used a lot of words, and they had a brilliant vocabulary, and yet they said nothing. They're brilliant dumb people. Let me give you an example. Uh, one is uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, he had this to say. Uh, let me bring him up for you. First of all, can we just celebrate this mustache? That, that's amazing. But anyway, what, what did he say? He said, when you look into an abyss, the abyss also looks into you. Now, I have no clue what that means. Do you? No idea. I inanimate things. The only thing I can think of is he was projecting Star Wars. This was an abyss that was actually looking back at Luke Skywalker because it wanted to eat him. But I don't, anyway, let's move on to the next one. Um, Socrates, I am the wisest man alive for I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. Now, I think I know where he's going, but at the same time, it's illogical to say I know nothing and I know one thing. That is smart dumbness, right? Uh, finally, Martin Heidegger. Uh, here, here's this one. The most thought-provoking thing in our thought-provoking time is that we're still not thinking. I have no idea what he's trying to say. I, I better think on that a little bit. But okay, enough about philosophers. Have you ever been in class where you could tell the professor was brilliant, knew their stuff, but they did not know how to communicate that to you? I've been in that. Over the head. Thank you very much. Um, or, or maybe it was uh, in a company. Uh, where, again, you knew there was a CEO or someone who really knew their stuff but, but did not understand what the organization really needed, uh, did not understand uh, how to relate with people, um, and, and so brilliant dumbness happened all the time. Could be with a doctor. A doctor might know the anatomy of the body very well but have a poor bedside manner, um, very, again, brilliant, dumb person when it comes to people. Happens all the time. In fact, I think even our society picks up on some brilliant dumbness. Uh, one of the phrases that I've heard, I'm probably dating myself, is the phrase YOLO. Anyone ever say that? Now, it's true. I mean, you only live once. But, but if this is inspiring you to pursue yourself with reckless abandon, to overspend, to overeat, to, you know, try, you know, drugs or alcohol too much, you know, this is brilliant dumbness, friends. And here's why this matters. I don't think any of us want to be dumb. Would you agree? I don't want to get to the end of my life and be like, he was, he, he was an idiot. Likeable guy, but really, really dumb. Right? None of us want that. Well, so I remember when I was in high school, and I thought that I was being taught all these things that would make me wise. I was a junior in high school, and I was trigonometry and studying augmented matrices. And I'm like, when am I ever going to use an augmented matrix in this calculator that I'll never see again, right? And, and, and so I'm like, okay, if I'm going to have to study all this stuff, why don't I find true wisdom? And it's then that I, I thought, I'm like, well, God, he, he has a book. And there's a man named Solomon who was given wisdom from God, and if I just listen to his cliff notes on life, maybe then I will be truly wise. So I took up, God up on his challenge, and I opened the book of Proverbs. And there in chapter 1, I found the key to wisdom, and something I want to share with you. Do you know what I found? Can you read the yellow with me? The fear of the Lord. Solomon said, if you have the fear of the Lord, the wisest man who ever lived, the fear of the Lord will make you truly wise. If you listen to him, 
You'll get to the end of your life, and I don't think anyone will say you were just a likable dumb person. If you live with the fear of the Lord, they will recognize, man, there were some weighty principles they were operating by. And the fear of the Lord is the overarching principle above them all. But do you know, like any good artist, Job actually stole this from someone? It wasn't his idea, the fear of the Lord. Rather, he got it from our man named, now what, what series are we in? Job. And Job, why did he get it? Job only got it because the Lord allowed him to suffer. And Job, what he teaches us is this. If you're taking notes, the first takeaway, that there is wisdom birthed out of suffering. And maybe some of you would, in your heart, amen that fact. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more today. There is tremendous wisdom birthed out of suffering to the degree that Harvard could never teach you. No Ivy League could ever teach you. 10,000 TED Talks could never teach you the wisdom that you can gain when God allows you to suffer. Because what Job found was the fear of the Lord. He was the one who wrote it first in the midst of his trial, in the midst of his suffering. And that's what we get to consider. But if you're just joining us, let me catch you up to our series a little bit. Let me explain again the, the, the story of Job just a little bit. Uh, so Job was a very famous, wealthy man. In a day, he lost it all. He lost his whole portfolio of stock, which was cattle. He lost 10 children. A couple days later, he lost his health. He, he loses all of this, and he's wrestling with suffering. During this book, we see that God never gives him an answer to why he's suffering. And so, spoiler alert, we never get an answer for why we're suffering. But we've been learning other things. For example, in one of our first weeks, we, we learned this, that God is worthy of love even apart from the blessings he bestows. When we suffer, we get a chance to praise God, not for what he's giving, but for who he is. Job said, the Lord gave, the Lord took away, the name of the Lord, still be praised, still worthy of praise. We, we've been also learning this, God may permit suffering as a means of purifying and strengthening the soul in godliness. We talked about how when we're in miserable circumstances, sometimes something beautiful can be formed from that. The story of Horatio Spafford, who when he lost four daughters, wrote this magnificent song called, It Is Well With My Soul. Job, who fought to say good things and said, you know, shall we accept good and not bad from the Lord? wise things coming out of suffering. It strengthens us. And the final thing that we need to dwell on a little bit in the next coming weeks is this principle. That God's thoughts and ways are moved by considerations too vast for the puny mind of man to comprehend. Now, please, if you're just joining us, if you're new to Christ, don't be offended by the, the puny mind of man comment. We, we just have this belief that, that there's, a, there's a father creator God. That we were the clay and he was the one forming something from that clay and this is something that we believe. So, so that's what we're going to get into today. So let's turn to the Word of God. Job chapter 28. It is the wisdom chapter in this book called Job. And uh, we're going to pick it apart a little bit today. Finding true wisdom. Here we go. It says, People assault the flinty rock with their hands. They lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. A.K.A., you can mine for gold and diamonds, but you cannot mine for wisdom. Going on. The deep says it's not in me. The sea says it's not with me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. So then, where does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Death and destruction say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. But here's the key. God understands the way to it. He alone knows where it dwells, for he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path to the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed and tested it. And he said to the human race, to you and I, can you say this phrase again? The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. This is what we get to consider again, what God has revealed to our hearts. May God so work through this message to guide you into a good path. Now at this point, we have an opportunity to talk to our neighbor. Could you talk to your neighbor and tell them, don't be foolish, fear the Lord. Don't be foolish, fear the Lord. All right. Still with me? Can we dig in? 
be digging. Um, so I believe that you can know a lot of information and still not be wise. And, and today is our, our cookout. And, and, and consider this. Someone could memorize the Betty Crocker cookbook, but does that make him a good cook? For example, I know the ingredients for French toast. You have three eggs, three-fourths cup milk. You have one-eighth tablespoon of salt, one-fourth tablespoon of vanilla extract, one tablespoon of sugar, a generous amount of cinnamon. But even though I know all of that, it doesn't mean that my French toast is going to come out golden brown, right? Or we think of the grill outside today. You might know that hamburgers and brats, they needed to be heated up. It's not rocket science, you know? It's not rocket science. But there's a difference between just warming up something and expertly grilling with the crisscross pattern, just the right amount of pink. You know what I'm saying. Right. And so what we learn is, again, the difference between knowing facts and actually being wise. Well, as we turn to the Word of God, uh, again, it says, you know, you can mine for certain things. You, you, can, you can try to find wisdom, but, but it is different than just knowing information. Wisdom takes time. And it's something I would permit to you is this, that wisdom is gleaned from experience. That's what I would tell you. The first takeaway, that wisdom is gleaned from experience. It's only after you grill for a while. It's only after you cook French toast many times, and, and I can make a golden brown, by the way. I know that because I, I use that uh, recipe, by the way. Um, but, but it only comes with experience. Now, as we go back to our conversation of suffering, the experience of suffering, the experience of pain, can teach us some wonderful things if we allow it. Isn't that true? And, and I consider this when I, when I turn to uh, a favorite player of mine named Anthony Rizzo. Anyone know Anthony Rizzo? Sorry, Sox fans. Um, Anthony Rizzo, you may know at age 18, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a form of cancer. And, and while his career trajectory was going this way, it kind of halted everything, made him pause. Now, thankfully, we know he recovered. Anthony Rizzo is doing just fine. But what he learned is how valuable compassion is. How valuable it is to fight for other people who may be in similar circumstances. And so if you're taking notes again, wisdom, here we go, here's his foundation. Um, the experience of suffering teaches us the wisdom of compassion. The wisdom of compassion. What he did was form his foundation. They just have a, had a laugh it off for cancer event where they raised $500,000 for those who are in similar circumstances. Why does he do that? Why is he inspired? Because he's been through suffering. Isn't it true? If you're counseling someone who's been through a similar thing you've been through, you approach them with wisdom. Your tone may be different. The advice may be different. Your approach and posture may all be different if God has allowed you to go through something. This is, again, the wisdom we find through the experience of pain. But there's more that we can learn. You know, I'm always intrigued by end-of-life matters. Intrigued by those who, who are at the end of their life and, and look back on life and, and the question, what would they have done differently? What would they have done differently? Studies have been done, and a few things always come out from those studies. For one, no one says, oh, I wish I would have worked more. I, I wish I would have put in more hours. 40, 60, 80, I, I, I wish I would have done that. Others also go on to say, I wish I had more family and friend time prioritize that a little bit more than I did. For me as a pastor, sometimes people will be real candid and honest, you know, pastor, I'm meeting with you to get my soul right because I know what's coming next. It is only when we are at the end of our life and in the midst of suffering that what matters most is distilled and comes to the surface. And so the experience of suffering teaches us the wisdom of what matters most. And, and isn't that true? If you've ever been in pain, if you've ever been in a rough circumstance, does it really matter if you go out to Pizza Hut or, or if you have a frozen pizza? Does it really matter how the Cubs or the Sox are doing? Do these things really matter? No. In fact, inspiration over this topic was, was hearing from a preacher who said, right now you and I should be working on our eulogy. Not the eulogy that we will write for ourselves, but rather the eulogy that other people will say about us. 
Right now, if you want to be wise, live in such a way that you want to hear people say certain things about you, that you really were a good family man, that you really were kind and generous. Work on that right now. For these are things that matter most. What do you want to hear? Suffering, again, distills it down to what truly is important. So you're nodding with me, and you're saying, yeah, pastor, there are some really good things that can be gained out of my experience with suffering. But the reality is not everyone will gain this understanding. The reality is some people will actually get worse because of suffering. What almost every commentator has agreed upon, that when suffering happens, it is a fork in the road. And this fork presents two options, that I can get better or I can get bitter. Right? I can get better, I can learn the lessons of wisdom, or I can get bitter to the point that no one wants to be around me, to the point that I'm not dealing well. And how do we ensure that when suffering hits, because it will hit, how do we ensure we will get better by it? Well, Job tells us. And that's why we've gathered here. Because God is in this place. Because God holds the key. And so what Job said is, you want to get better? God understands the way. He alone knows where wisdom dwells. What we heard is that the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And so, if you're taking notes, the fear of the Lord can help us get better through suffering. The fear of the Lord in the midst of all of that will lead us to get better on the other side. But what is the fear of the Lord? A lot has been written over the fear of the Lord. It's not a very simple thing to illustrate. But I want to go there with you, and the fear of the Lord, in my mind, is best illustrated through this picture. I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of that astronaut. Now, by the way, I don't think this is spatially correct. I think the Earth would actually be further away. But anyway, if you were that astronaut, perhaps would you feel a little tiny, in the midst of the vastness of space? Perhaps might you just lose yourself in the awe and wonder of the beauty of the atmosphere of the earth, of the continents that you see, of the stars that are around you. But perhaps if you were that astronaut, would you be a little terrified? Wondering if your suit is going to hold out, wondering if you have enough oxygen, if something goes wrong, will you just be lost in space? I think this is a good picture of what it might be like to be before God. Let me give you a definition for fear of the Lord then. I believe it would be a reverential awe for a God that's so far more powerful and beautiful than we can imagine right now. Just like that astronaut. Man, there is beauty here. Man, space is powerful. Man, I am in awe of all of this. So how do we live in fear of the Lord? Or maybe let me ask you this question. Would you say our society has a healthy fear of the Lord? Would you say in general the people that you associate with have reverential awe when it comes to the idea of God or the concept of God or God's working in the world? Is it awe that you find and reverence and submission? What about our own lives? Would you say that you operate, you walk around each day with an awe, a reverence, a humble submission. To put it another way, do you stand above God or are you willing to stand below Him? Well, here's a litmus test. When you suffer, even during this series, is the framework of this series so that God can answer to you? So that God can explain Himself to you? Or is the framework of this series humble submission to the one that we will someday answer? When you read the Bible, when you listen to a pastor, do you stand above the Bible's words, looking in judgment on what God has revealed, saying it better fit my worldview, otherwise I can't even comprehend why that's written? Or do you allow yourself to stand under it and to say, I don't know everything. God, you might know better. When it comes to evil, when God has clearly revealed something, don't go there. Don't do that. It's not good. Do you pause in reverence and submission to the will of God? 
Or if you're honest, sometimes you just care less even though you know it's wrong. As I take that own test, I, I, I recognize that I could have a, a healthier fear of the Lord. Do you know what I'm saying? So what I encourage us all to do is repent. Change our mind about it. Because reality is this powerful, this beautiful God, he's not ours by right. And it's a dreadful thing to ha- fall in the hands of a living God. So what's our hope in the midst of this? If like space, God could consume us. How do we ever get to the point where we could love a God like this? Let me give you an answer there. The Bible tells us the reason we love him, instead of just being terrified, it's this. We love because he first loved us. The way that you love him, and don't just stand in dread, is you look at the face of Jesus Christ. And you see him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you see him submitting to the Father's will, illustrating what the fear of the Lord is all about. And you remember he did that for you. You remember the cross and the beatings and the floggings. That was punishment paid so that we don't dread a powerful God. Rather, we live in peace and security as ones who have been set free through Jesus Christ. We look to Jesus. We don't take our eyes off of him. In fact, I want you to know, if you're watching online, if you're new to Christ, he loves you more than you know right now. And his power, it's not used against you. Rather, it was used for you in Jesus Christ and through his resurrection. So we can approach this God, enjoying his beauty, enjoying his power, knowing that we're called the sons and daughters of God and that we're forgiven for all of our missteps. But friends, as we considered the fear of the Lord and did a gut check of where we are in the timeline, what would it look like then if you and I went forward this day, a vision of the world, of of Christians who just went out and said, I'm going to live with wisdom. I'm going to live with the fear of the Lord. What would that look like? Well, to talk about this, hard transition, I'm going to talk about Air filters. (laughs) And this is your friendly reminder that if you haven't replaced one of these, I think, what, every year or something like that? Maybe not. Air filters. What what is the concept of air filters? Well, the concept is that as air is being pushed through, this thing is going to collect all the things that we don't want to breathe in. And and there are many different levels of air filters, by the way. You can buy a $100 air filter that will pretty much catch everything. Um, But but in general, it costs catches the dust and the the pollen and the allergens and and smog. If you buy that fancy one, where is smog, by the way? Anyway, but it catches all the stuff you don't want so that when you breathe in, you breathe only the purified air uh, that you want, right? Life is like living with a filter, isn't it? And we have filters. And we use filters in order to try to be wise. And I think one of the most popular filters when it comes to how to live is this filter called family and friends. And many of you, this is your first choice for filters. The circle that you are in, what what you grew up doing, the blueprint for your family, that that is pretty much as as information comes your way, it gets pumped out based on what your family did. That's one way to approach living. Well, there there are other filters. Um, Another filter that we have is, is culture. You could call it political correctness. You could call it what everyone else is doing. Um, but, but culture. And, and based on what they deem appropriate, it, it's, based a, it's basically going to pump out what, what you're going to do and, and find if there's a wise way to live. But finally, how would we live with a fear of the Lord? What would that filter look like? Well, I'm a simple man who believed that God, in a miraculous way, preserved his words and directives to us in this thing called the Bible. And I believe he had his hand in it. And so if you want a a fear of the Lord filter, I believe it's a biblical one. I believe it's saying, God, based on all the information, based on all the things I could do, I'm going to let your Bible catch everything that is untrue and pump it out to what I actually do. Now, let's consider if this would truly lead to wisdom. Let's go to the family and friends one and, and, and judge it based on wisdom. Now, have you ever gotten advice from your family and it was really well-intentioned, but it was completely wrong? Anyone with me? It has happened more than once to me, right? 
And these are people who really love me, who really cared about me, and were completely wrong. Right? So some of you know what I'm talking about. They just don't always get it right as much as they want to. This next one, how wise is this? Don't even get me started. Right? Come on. Every generation seems to change their mind on what morality looks like or style looks like or what's popular and how you should treat people. It's a pendulum swinging one way or the other, not really catching true north, not really being in the middle. Don't get me started on what they promote as far as morality or sexuality or, or what you should be pursuing, right? This one definitely will get it wrong. In fact, there's a Bible passage over that. You don't know what your life is like when you listen only to the filter of culture? It says you'll be tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and conceit, craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Is that what you want to have in life? Blown here and there by everyone else's opinion? But then the Bible. If you take God up in the charge of listening to his voice, what might you find? I think of what it says about God in Numbers. In Numbers it says, God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? A.K.A. when you use this filter, God, he gets it right. God is the one who made a path for the thunderstorms. God is the one who measured out the rain. God is the one who brings every wind, and sometimes the wind blows over our tents, but that's okay. We put them back up. But anyway, um, God is always right. So if we use this filter, it might actually help us. So let's use them. Let's use them. Let, let's, before we leave today, just consider this realm of suffering. And when it comes to suffering, for those who get bitter, sometimes they're overwhelmed by the shock of, of suffering. They're shocked that it happened. Do you know what I'm saying? Shocked. I can't believe this happened. And I think that there are many things that could shock us in life. I think that whenever I'm merging into traffic and someone lets me in without a battle and even gives me a wave, that's shocking. When I see a guy in a romper, that's always shocking. <laughs> but what I would permit to you that should not be shocking is that we suffer. But how do we get there? Why are we like, ah, I can't believe it? Why? Is it perhaps because our primary filter is maybe this one, family and friends, and they say, you don't deserve this. I can't believe this happened to you. Very well-intentioned. But they're dumb, smart people. Or maybe it's our culture that says, you know what, you're a victim. You've got to fight for your rights. But don't worry, in the meantime, what goes around comes around. That's not true, by the way. Grace breaks that up. Anyway, right? We're shocked because of culture. But if we truly had a biblical filter... Would we be shocked by suffering? If we remember what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve rebelled, if we remember the words of Jesus, Jesus who said, in this world you will have what? Donuts? No. Trouble. You and I, as long as we walk, we'll have chaotic messes until we're called to heaven. And they are complex, and they're not easy to decipher or navigate. They are troublesome, they're filled with worry, labor, toil. There's trouble, friends. This is not shocking. But what is also not shocking is that God has overcome. That you and I someday will be a place where he wipes every tear from our eyes. Where you and I will be gathered where we never have to battle again. But we'll remember we're in the meantime. So what can a biblical filter do? A biblical filter can help us pass the shock of suffering. Unfortunately, my friends, we will have troubles. And that's why it's good to gather here regularly, because we have hope and healing in this place. But a biblical filter can do more. A biblical filter, last point, it can give us wisdom past the pain of suffering. And the pain of suffering is something very humbling. For the strongest people, in the midst of their dark season, in the midst of their dark days, have a hard time with the pain of suffering. But when it comes to the different filters, not all of them are helpful. 
family and friends, they might tell us, well, time heals all wounds. You're in a season, but don't worry, you're going to get through. Time's the answer. Don't get me started on what culture will tell you. Culture might tell you in the pain of suffering, you need to cope by all these wrong ways. You can entertain yourself till you're numb. You can spend money you don't have. You can eat too much. You can go out and party. Uh, that's really how you get through pain, right? Do all those things. Pursue happiness with reckless abandon. That's how you get through. What will the Bible say if we stand below? If we go first here to hear from our Father? Perhaps will you hear the word, fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus. In the midst of pain, I know of no better hope than fixing our eyes on Jesus. Because time doesn't heal all wounds. But Jesus can. And by his wounds we are healed. How do I understand my own suffering if I don't see the one who loved me most suffer much more than I will ever experience. The wisdom found in looking at Jesus is better than 10,000 TED Talks, better than what Harvard or Stanford could offer. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You know, as I was studying for this sermon series, I came across a wonderful quote. When you talk about suffering, sometimes it's called the cross that we bear. That is, Jesus bore a cross, so we bear a cross. And consider this quote. The real contents of the book of Job is a mystery of the cross, but the cross of Golgotha, where Jesus died, is the solution of the enigma of every cross. If you are in pain, I know of no better answer than to look to Jesus, who loved you, suffered what you ultimately deserved, and set you free. May you live with fear of the Lord. May you use your biblical filter first and often. And may you see again the beauty of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Please stand.